and that was on the piano. And I'm going to now play, I played Philip Wesley's Moonlight and Jasmine, followed by a little piece I wrote. And now this is Pretty to the Afternoon of a Fawn.
It's Prelude to the Afternoon of the, of the, of the Fawn by Claude Debussy. playing on a Yamaha mini keyboard. Thank you so much, Kim. That was really deeply appreciated. I didn't have a chance to hear much of your music. I really you. appreciate you providing it. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, um, everybody, I am sorry that the meeting is starting a bit late. We're having some serious technical problems here at Chapman. Um, at this point, we do not have um, any audio. Um, other than what people are getting on their cell phones um, and uh, and maybe what we can get through the uh, the computer. Um, nothing is going through to the the general um, uh, auditorium sound system. So we've been trying to uh, John Hood has been working overtime trying to get the problem resolved. Um, I really appreciate that. And unfortunately, uh, it appears to be still a work in progress. But with that, welcome to the January meeting of Orange County Astronomers, where we are demonstrating that, as usual, astronomers can go with the flow and still manage somehow or other to put on a meeting in spite of all the challenges. Thank you so much for being here. Um, this, by the way, is the last day of our election season. 
Um, I am the 2022 president, and uh, there may be a different president in 2023. That kind of depends on all of you. Um, one way or another, please, if you have not done so already, um, if you're in the auditorium and can hear me, um, we do have a ballot box down here and some ballots um, and some envelopes. And if you are hearing it remotely, you still have an opportunity to vote electronically. Hmm? It is here. I know. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, one, um, let me see, we, we do have our announcement person actually here in person. Um, our wonderful Kyle, who is in California, as opposed to back east, um, and enjoying our storms instead of snowstorms. So I think at this point, I will turn it over to him and allow him to do the um, announcements. And uh, then we will carry on from there. Um, thanks for your patience. And um, here's Kyle. Does someone have slides since I don't have them here? Do we have slides? Uh, Kyle, do you have the, uh, I'm sorry, Raisa, uh, can we show the slides? Are you missing the announcement slides there? Is that? Yeah, we don't have them here. Okay, let me, um, if Alan could uh, help us with that, uh, that Great. would much appreciate awesome. it. There we go. Let's see on here. on here now. No, okay. Right now it's done. Awesome. Can we go to the beginning? The, the beginning. Okay. Yep. Good. Okay, you can move on to the next slide. Awesome. So first, we'll start by welcoming all new members. Uh, you can get name tags here if you're in the auditorium. Uh, otherwise, they'll be mailed to you uh, probably in a month or two, uh, depending on when you join in the particular month. Move on. Next slide. Uh, just a reminder, as Barbara already spoke about, uh, you can vote in the elections. Uh, voting ends at midnight tonight, so you can either use, if you're remote, the electronic ballots that were mailed out to you or you can use the ballot box and the ballots here, right here at Chapman. And here are the candidates. Uh, even though no one is, none of these offices are being contested, it is still appreciated if you do vote. So it's a vote of confidence. So the club leadership knows that they have the full support of the club members. And accountability. Yes, and accountability. Uh, star parties are still on hold. Uh, weighing on various factors, but please keep checking the online calendar for more information on that. Astrophysics special interest group meeting is on the 20th, 7.30 at the Heritage Museum. You can see when the beginners classes along with the board meeting. The board meeting occurs online. The beginners class is also at the Heritage Museum. You can find updates on all the club's events online on the calendar. The uh, outreach events, that program is still on hold. We are looking for an outreach coordinator to take over that position. So if you are interested, please contact Alan Smallbone. The coffee stand is upstairs. You can get coffee, donuts, uh, water, et cetera. That's all up there. I think it's a dollar for each item. I don't remember exactly. But feel free at any time to go up there. Grab something if you're in the auditorium. Uh, the adopt a scope program is still ongoing, so you can uh, see the current inventory and look in adoption agreement and see the policies of that online. Uh, you can see on the website here where to go. If you are interested in having an IM featured in the Serious Astronomer newsletter please uh, contact Dave Fisher at the email there and he'll review any items of interest. There's just some examples of types of things that are looked for to be put in the newsletter. And once again, 
uh, I know this has been said through multiple meetings, but if you would like to only receive your serious astronomer newsletter online and not have a printed copy mailed to you, uh, you can email Charlie or speak to him here if you're here at Chapman. Uh, once again, everyone receives a printed copy by default, and you will only not receive one if you opt out of receiving a printed copy. Please remember if you do have an ANZA pad to keep that clear of weeds for uh, fire prevention, just making sure the site stays clean and safe. I'm gonna skip this one. Some, uh, please note that the next uh, general meeting will be on the third Friday of the month, February 17th, and not the usual date of the second Friday. And, and please do check the, uh, the website in case there are any changes. Um, you know, that's always a good thing to do anyway. <laughs> Great. So next we'll be welcoming Chris Butler to do the WhatsApp presentation. Thank you. Okay. Awesome. Hi, everybody. Uh, Going to jump through the what's up here um, as best we can. So everybody understands this is the uh, this is the what's up part of the program. Um, let's go ahead and uh, jump in real quick and see what we can do. Um, all right. Uh, let me jump in here. All right. Um, let's have a look at what's going on in the sky in January. Um, as far as the moon tonight, we have got, uh, we're just closing in on last quarter moon, so the moon will rise quite late. We've already had our full moon on the 6th of January. Uh, new moon, dark of the moon, will be January 21st. As far as the planets, uh, Mercury's in the morning sky. If you like to get up early, it'll be at its best on January 28th at O dark 30 before the sun rises. Um, Venus, want to call attention to Venus. Venus has now returned to the evening sky. Uh, you probably have noticed it now after it gets dark. It's low in the uh, southwest, of course, blazing away, very bright. Um, and it'll be getting higher and more prominent as the months go by. It'll be around for quite a while. Uh, Mars, talking about being around. Mars is fading right now. It's been the big story. We passed it last month. Uh, Mars will actually drop by about two and a half times uh, its brightness over the course of this month. So it's fading and it's shrinking a bit as we're pulling away from it. So it's already down to uh, 13 arc seconds diameter. So you want to catch Mars pretty quickly if you can. Uh, Jupiter is blazing away and is prominent in the evening sky. Uh, note it does set by 1033 in the evening. So you want to make that a part of your early evening observations. Uh, Saturn, code orange on my list because it's dropping into the sunset very quickly. Um, it's only 30 degrees from the sun. It's setting at 730. So it's really kind of out of range. Uranus is in better shape. Uh, it's best, though, before 11 o'clock in the evening. It's in the evening sky, but it does set well before midnight. Uh, Neptune, code orange as well, uh, dropping pretty quickly into the sunset. Not a good time for Neptune. And Pluto, forget about it. It's getting ready to pass behind the sun right now. And that, in astronomy terms, is a bit of a, an inconvenience for looking at Pluto. Uh, Mars, we mentioned, we showed this to you last time I talked with you. Um, you can see Mars got biggest when we passed it. Um, and it is now between the two uh, that you see to your right. It is starting to shrink in the sky and get fainter. It's still okay, but you want to catch it right away because we're pulling away from it. Um, this is a a recent photograph of Mars taken by David Nakamoto of Griffith Observatory uh, gives it a sense of what it would look like in a telescope. Something else with Mars for the month. On the 30th, Mars is going to pass behind the moon. And these are the times for it. It is visible prominently from Southern California. Uh, it's going to spend well, ballpark of an hour back behind the moon. You can see there how it disappears behind 
the dark limb of the moon and then emerges from the lit side of the moon. Jupiter is prominent, as I say, it is not shrinking the way that Mars does. Jupiter pretty much always the same size in our sky, always prominent, but you do want to catch it over the next month and in the first part of your evenings. Looking at the comet, everybody talking about comet C slash 2022E3ZTF. Where do they get these names? Um, it, of course, is a designation that, that's perfectly fine. Um, it's gotten in the news because this, telescope, uh, this uh, comet may actually get bright enough to be seen with the unaided eye. May. I want to make a point here. This doesn't mean it's going to be looming over your house and causing accidents on the freeway. It is something you would definitely be able to pick up with binoculars uh, if you're in a dark sky, but it's not going to be something you just look up and notice. Okay. Uh, now, this is the comet's path through the sky. I marked where it is tonight. Um, if you know your star charts, you know this is in the far northern sky. Uh, right now it's over near the area of Hercules, roughly, which you can see during the wee hours. I'll mark it on a chart for you later that we'll see. Uh, but it sweeps to the right across your picture there. That's going to be uh, its motion through the month of January. It's close to Polaris at the far north on the 30th of January. Notice that that's so far north, it's visible all night. So if you just give it a couple weeks, you won't have to stay up till Odark 30. Um, jump into the sky at 6 p.m. when the sky is just starting to get dark. I mentioned that Venus has rejoined us, and Venus is low in the sky right now. It'll get a lot higher over the next few months. Uh, not far from it is Saturn. Saturn a lot fainter, of course, and more affected by the sun's glow. Okay, uh, Jupiter, still farther away from the sun, stays up longer. Uh, good Good target for having a look at. And Mars is quite high as the evening begins. Give it a little more time till 9 p.m., three hours uh, later. Notice how uh, early the sun sets still. We're having very long nights. Uh, 9 p.m., Jupiter has moved all the way off to the right side of your screens, getting ready to set. But it's been replaced by all of these brilliant stars of the winter sky, including the area around Mars. Um, Mars called out there for you. Uh, Capella is the brightest star in Auriga, the chariot driver. That's in the far north at this hour. Mars is in Taurus, the bull. Rigel is the uh, knee of Orion, the hunter, a famously man-shaped constellation. Uh, Sirius marks, well, Sirius is the brightest of all the nighttime stars, marking the big dog Canis Major. And Procyon is the brightest star of Canis Minor, the little dog. I will call your attention to the fact that the second brightest nighttime star, Canopus, is barely visible for those of us in Southern California now, because we have someone with us this evening from Hawaii. I'm jealous because you get a much better look at Canopus at your latitude than we do. That's about all we get. Uh, I want to pay attention here with Canis Major. I want to focus on that this month for our constellation feature. Uh, Partly because it is the brightest of all the nighttime stars, it's also up for a long time during the evening. Easy for everybody to find, uh, marked by Sirius, the brightest of all the nighttime stars. Now, we've had controversy about this over the years. I maintain that it does not look like a dog. Um, I maintain that it looks like a surfer. All right, now, uh, because Mr. Lomberg, you're from Hawaii, you're going to agree with me on this. That looks like a surfer with one arm out in front of them, one arm back behind their head, and two little legs down on a surfboard surfing to the right across the picture. It doesn't look like a dog. It looks like a surfer, surfer major. Um, easy pattern to find once you know what it's supposed to look like. To modern astronomers, it's not a dog or a surfer. It's actually an area of sky with the precise boundaries. Uh, as you see here, it actually, it's this area of sky. That's what a constellation is now. And within it is this pattern, again, obviously a surfer with Sirius marking the head. Uh, notice many of the stars here are not only bright, they have proper names because they are bright. Uh, stars like Adhara and Aludra. So you can get to know the names of the stars in the pattern. 
Sirius, of course, is the star of the show, but there are plenty of other things to look at here. In yellow are shown star clusters, and this constellation has a slew of them. Notably, M41, call your attention to that, because it can be your first thing you find if you're a beginner, even with binoculars. If you lock onto Sirius, brightest star in the night sky, all you have to do is drop about eight degrees towards the southern horizon, drop straight down, and you'll be looking at M41. There are plenty of others that I'll show you a couple pictures. Notice NGC 2362 is down below near the surfer's legs. Um, this is a beautiful star cluster called the Taucanus cluster. Um, in pink, I will give you a nebula, okay? Uh, up in the north part of the constellation, NGC 2359, known as Thor's Helmet. Cool, right? Yeah, it doesn't come with Chris Helmsworth, but uh, it's wonderful uh, uh, nebula. And then out with red, I do want to point out there are galaxies lurking out here. For those of you who are experts with large telescopes, you can hunt down NGC 2207 and its close friend. Sirius, of course, the brightest of all the nighttime stars, famous just looking with your eyes, remember you are looking at the dog star, which is famous, and you're also looking at the star of the Nile that the Egyptians used to worship. So this is a star with a lot of history. If you're not into the mythology and history thing, you can also train a good telescope on this and look for the pup star, the companion, a dim star orbiting very close to this brilliant star, hard to see it in the glare, but do notice from the orbit diagram that they are at their widest separation basically now. So if you've ever wanted to give this a try and look for this elusive star Sirius B, this is a good time to do it. Star cluster M41 is absolutely gorgeous. Here's a very pretty picture of it. One of my absolute favorites. Notice it includes some golden uh, colored stars as well. Nice contrast with a lot of the blue stars in there. Um, this is that little Tau Canis cluster down in the surfer's feet. And I love how different this is. When you look at clusters like this, there are many stars of similar brightness. But in this case, the bright star Tau Canis is surrounded by a whole groupy fan club, a little club really close to it of fainter stars. It's very pretty and very different. This is Thor's helmet up in the north part of the constellation. Not much of a visual target, but good for large telescopes in dark skies and also a good target for you astrophotographers and astro imagers to go after. I promised you a galaxy and oh boy, here's now, all right. This is a Hubble Space Telescope picture, meaning it's just slightly less impressive than what I see with my telescope. But your telescope might not show it quite this large, bright, or colorful. Um, of course, it looks like a little hazy spot galaxies do in our telescopes, but a beautiful and famous uh, galaxy pair interacting with one another. It's right there in Canis Major. Um, so there to remind you, if you had a favorite out of what I mentioned, that shows where they all are. If you let the time go by, midnight notice, Canis Major down there in the bottom part um, uh, is, and you see the surfer there, um, that is still very prominent in the sky, as is Mars. It's midnight, and Mars is still going strong up there with all those winter stars. Notice, though, that by this time, the springtime stars are starting to rise. Constellations like Ursa Major, the Great Bear, Leo the Lion, Hydra, uh, even Arcturus is starting to rise at this hour. So you could be hunting lots of galaxies, globular star clusters, and so on. You could just stay up a little later. If you go towards 6 a.m., you've been pulling an all-nighter. The sun is beginning to uh, glow and fill up the sky with light. Um, straight overhead, you've got a bright star, and you have some other bright stars starting to rise out of the east before the sun spoils your view. Uh, the bright star is Arcturus in the Otis, the herdsman. Uh, Vega and the summer triangle stars are starting to rise. Um, notice that, and this is for tonight, that's where that comet is. If you stay up, you look in the early morning, you can catch the comet. But remember, it'll be visible all night in about two weeks. So there's a little rundown of a few things you can see. And I hope all of you have been able to read my lips. This is for our, our friends in the audience. Read my lips. Um, and in the meantime, I'm going to wish you uh, majestic skies. I hope you've enjoyed the What's Up. 
and I will talk to you soon. Thanks. Thank you very much, Chris. Yet another great presentation. Uh, we thoroughly enjoy, enjoyed it. Thank you very much. And Thank I hope you see all the kudos that's coming your way uh, via Zoom. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. So hello and welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Reza. I'm the vice president here. And uh, I hope you've enjoyed the show so far. Uh, this is our first uh, meeting at 2023. So uh, happy belated new year to everybody. And without further ado, let me go ahead into introducing our main speaker tonight. Um, he is one of the world's most distinguished space artists. He was designer of the Voyager Golden Record and Emmy Award winning chief artist of Carl Sagan's Cosmos series. He's a winner of the ASP's Klumpke Roberts Award for astronomy popularization and has an asteroid named after him. He's joining us live from uh, Kona, Hawaii. And uh, please join me in welcoming John Lumber. John. Thank you, Reza. I'm very happy to uh, be here with you. I hope people can hear me. Hi to all those in person and all those online. I'm uh, speaking as uh, Chris said from Kona, Hawaii, where I've lived for over 30 years and enjoyed our beautiful night skies and hope uh, many of you will have the opportunity to come and visit here sometime as well. And as a bonus, you might get a chance to see some lava as well. Uh, I'm gonna talk about uh, my work as an astronomical artist. Let me start screen sharing here. Let me get into the right mode. There. So I'm gonna talk about my work as an astronomical artist, but first what I'm going to do is plug my book. Uh, and this is a book that should be coming out later this year in the fall. It's called the Encyclopedia Cosmologica. And there are four of us involved with it. Uh, William Lidwell is the editor and designer of the book. Uh, Ethan Siegel, who's an astrophysicist who writes for a lot of places, is the writer. And then the artwork is by uh, fellow space artist Mark Garlick and me. And the concept is that it's the history of the universe, uh, 100 million years per page. So it's 140, 100 million year slices in the history of the universe. Uh, with a full page picture on uh, one side. Let me turn my screen here a little bit. And we go from literally the origins of the universe and this picture shows the uh, origin of galaxies uh, to the formation of large scale structure. Here's the uh, so-called great wall of galaxies. Uh, we look at the history of our own Milky Way and trace events such as the encounters with the Sagittarius dwarf galaxy, which uh, our Milky Way has had multiple encounters with and uh, which has donated its uh, fair share of stars to the larger Milky Way. And then we talk about the, uh, the planets uh, that have formed around the multiple stars in our galaxy, the many different kinds of, of planets. Here's a hot Jupiter. And then we talk about the other kinds of life that might evolve uh, on the planets in, in our and other galaxies. And one of the interesting thing is that uh, radio telescopes everywhere might look similar since their shape is driven by the, uh, the function in a form follows function kind of way. So I like the idea that on uncounted planets in the universe, there are radio telescopes. Here's a picture by uh, Mark Garlick showing a rain of metallic 
uh, material on a super hot planet where molten metal falls from the sky like rain. And Mark's uh, envisioning of some of the inhabitants of some of these other worlds. If you're interested, you can pre-order and track our progress by going to uh, the uh, website listed there, cosmologica.card with two R's for some reason, dot CO. And you can, uh, you can pre-order and uh, find out when we're gonna actually publish the thing. Well, I guess I was destined to be a, uh, an astronomical artist. Some of the earliest art I did reflects it. This is when I was about six. And you'll note I had the two moons of Mars and uh, the canals, which back in the 50s when I did this was still very much uh, an open question whether Mars did have canals. In my teen years, I was drawn more towards comics. And I'm probably one of the few uh, space artists not terribly influenced by Chesley Bonestell. My influence were Marvel comics and the kind of posters and album art that was being done in the 60s and 70s. This was uh, an early painting of mine. But I was always interested in astronomy and uh, found myself uh, drawn to that subject matter. I was especially uh, influenced by the work of uh, Carl Sagan and his early book, Intelligent Life in the Universe. And uh, I did some pictures that were inspired by, by his and other ideas and, and basically wrote him, wrote him a fan letter and uh, suggested uh, how much I had been influenced by him. And, and he wrote back and he lived in Ithaca, which was not far from Toronto where I was living at the time. And he suggested that we meet and uh, we had a kind of a funny meeting story because I knew he was going to be in the airport, but I didn't know what he looked like. And uh, I didn't know exactly which flight he was on. I was just going to meet him in the general area. So I taped uh, the Drake equation, which is a now famous, but then fairly obscure equation uh, trying to describe the number of civilizations in the galaxy, named after Frank Drake, who invented it. And I taped it to my portfolio and stood in the airport, figuring he'd be the only person in the airport to recognize it. And he was, and we got off to a good start. And he invited me to illustrate his first book, uh, first book for a popular audience anyway, The Cosmic Connection, that was in 1973. And for that, it was uh, only in black and white. So I had to do uh, a lot of new work in black and white for the book. Uh, many of which, many of the pieces were inspired by uh, previous work of Carl and a few pieces uh, were by me and inspired actual chapters in the book. This was uh, one of Carl's favorite metaphors that the exploration of the solar system that we were engaged in now was analogous to the great explorations of the past on earth. I'm looking forward to a topic that kind of mutually uh, you could say obsessed both of us, which was the possibility of being contacted by an extraterrestrial civilization's radio messages. And uh, that was actually the, the real bond between us uh, that shared interest in that. And we talked about it very often. I built for him in his home in Ithaca, a 3D model galaxy. It was built on uh, parallel planes of plexiglass. And the paint glowed under ultraviolet light. So when all the lights in the room were off, you were just looking at this galaxy floating in space. And Carl and I had many conversations uh, in front of that galaxy and, and like to imagine the other civilizations that might be in it. Uh, so many of them, in fact, that I started a series of paintings called the Encyclopedia Galactica, which envisioned some of the kinds of civilizations that he and other scientists were talking about. Uh, this is a poster that's available from Astronomy Magazine, if anybody is interested in studying it more closely. And then a uh, few years after Carl and I started working together, he uh, became involved with the, or got me involved with the Voyager mission. I had been 
working as a radio journalist for the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, covering the Viking mission to Mars and was going to be covering the Voyager mission for them. So I already knew something about it. But Carl invited me to participate in a very special project. And if you look at the spacecraft, you'll notice this odd looking object on the side. It's the only part of the spacecraft that has no apparent function. Uh, it's a box and it's a box with a drawing on it that explains how to use the contents of the box, which are, uh, there are two boxes because there are two spacecraft and there's one on each. And each contains a metal record and an LP, exactly like old style LPs, except made of, uh, of copper and then gold coated to protect against chemical uh, erosion. And they're intended as messages. The Voyager spacecraft were intended to explore the outer solar system, but as a result of their trajectory, uh, just went on towards the stars forever. So these were designed basically as, uh, as gifts. And there were a few of us who were privileged to be able to uh, design uh, this gift for... Uh, for extraterrestrials, should they ever find the spacecraft and, and wonder about us. And most of the contents of the record is, uh, is music, and uh, music from all times and all nations, uh, at least a representative of, of it, uh, pieces from ancient China and from uh, Russia and from uh, India and from Japan. And one of my favorites, uh, an edition that I was responsible for was uh, a piece by Mozart, uh, one of my favorite composers who otherwise would have been overlooked. So of all the contributions to the record, I think that's the one I'm proudest of. But the record contains everything, including rock and roll from Chuck Berry. And uh, intended as a, as a gift, uh, the spacecraft tells a lot about what our uh, technology is like, and the motion tell the music is supposed to tell what our emotional life is like. And my main uh, contribution to the record was uh, designing a sequence of images that was supposed to show what the Earth is like to the inhabitants. But the first image is actually a calibration circle. If we go back to the uh, record cover, you see there's a uh, a diagram on the cover, I drew this drawing that shows how the cartridge and stylus that we included with the record is to be placed on the record, top view and side view, and then how the video signals, that's how the pictures were, were encoded on the record, how they're to be reconstructed into a picture. And the first picture we show is the calibration circle. Now, what I wanted to do here was just briefly run through all of the pictures, and I wanted to do it to another piece of music that I suggested for the record, a, a Bach violin piece, which I'm going to play. I know many of you won't be able to hear it, but uh, at least it paces me, and it'll give you a very quick image of what I had to do, which was pretend I was an alien. I was the kind of designated alien in the project. I'm imagining I was seeing Earth for the first time in these pictures and trying to interpret it. So, of course, you'd have a lot more time to study it than I'm going to give you now, but see what impression you form.
So that's Earth, at least as we did it in six weeks. The time that the record will last is to be measured in many millions of years, but we only had six weeks to do it. People have charted the future trajectories of both spacecraft and how they'll orbit the center of the galaxy like everything else over the next millions of years. And over the very long periods of time, it may be that the Voyager, at least one of them, has a good chance of being flung out of our galaxy when our galaxy uh, interacts with uh, the Andromeda galaxy billions of years from now, in which case the lifetime of the record, or at least one of the records, might be measured not in billions of years, but in trillions of years. Uh, and even after that, in the far distant reaches of time when galaxies as we know them have all merged into vast super galaxies, there may be still some pieces of the Voyager records, some fragments of them floating around out there. The most durable thing is probably the stylus on the cartridge to play the record. We should have engraved a, a message on that. After the Voyager record, the next big project we did was uh, Cosmos, the TV series, which premiered in uh, 1980. And I was the chief artist for that and supervised the creation of most of the special effects sequences for it, uh, supervising a team of artists, uh, including Adolf Schaller, who did the cover of the, of the book. Cosmos actually started as a textbook that Carl was going to write called The Backbone of Night which was the name that the Bushmen of the Kalahari gave to the Milky Way. They saw it as the backbone of a gigantic beast that was the universe. And a lot of the ideas from Cosmos originated in the backbone of night. In fact, there's even a chapter in Cosmos still called the backbone of night. But a lot of my work was making the images that Carl would see on his spaceship uh, window. Uh, as he flew through the galaxies. And this was all before uh, computer animation. In fact, it was just getting started. So we did all this the old Disney way on cell acetate with airbrushes and paintbrushes. Uh, each image had to be done on many parallel layers of acetate. So for example, to paint this galaxy, I would paint the background of it first, and then maybe the central glow and then the, the closer arms and each layer would have some more. And there were about 25 layers altogether, which were then shot and composited in the camera. They were shot one at a time and composited in, in a moving camera. And when I talk to animators today about doing it this way, it's like talking about working on a sailing ship in the age of uh, motorized boats. You just never would do it this way again, except maybe for fun. Uh, we've pretty much been replaced by computers, but this is how we did it back in Cosmos. 
there were a lot of models that required to be built too. Uh, we were doing Cosmos just as Voyager was embarking on its mission. So I painted this model of Callisto, for example, literally the same day that the picture uh, came down from the spacecraft. Here's our art room and here are some of the Cosmos artists. That's Adolf Schaller and uh, Don Davis, who did a lot of the Mars work and planetary models. Not shown in this picture is uh, Rick Sternbach, who uh, went on to achieve fame as one of the principal designers for Star Trek The Next Generation and Star Trek Voyager. And there on the far side, uh, if you can see her, is Sue Brown, who was the artist who I worked with on the uh, evolution sequence, which was uh, uh, one of the very first computer sequences to do what became known as morphing, which is now done in three dimensions with color and shading. But at this time, doing it in line art was a great breakthrough. So I was working on the one hand with Stephen Jay Gould, the uh, evolutionary biologist, to try to figure out what is the sequence that we want to show in evolution. And then with Jim Blinn, a computer guru from JPL, who was helping to invent computer graphics about how to make these drawings so they would work. And then Sue Brown did the drawings and, and here's the sequence. It has music, but uh, I don't know if you'll be able to hear it. some of the things that molecules do given four billion years of evolution. Well, Cosmos uh, elevated Carl to national prominence and uh, I'm still struck by how many scientists today still come up to me and tell me that their career was to some degree influenced by Cosmos. And I always thank them on behalf of Carl. I think that would have been his uh, the, the favorite legacy that so many people were brought to science, either as an interest or to actually become scientists as a, as a result of Cosmos. And uh, I'm uh, surprised at just how lasting an effect that it, it seemed to have. Uh, Carl's career took a little bit of an unusual turn and mine too. Uh, we, we could have stayed in space, but Carl's interests became uh, involved in nuclear issues. And that was because studying dust storms on Mars had alerted a number of scientists to the notion that part of the impact of nuclear war would be to throw so much dust into the atmosphere of Earth that we'd have what they called a nuclear winter. Uh, that would be a climate catastrophe that would affect the whole Earth. So even if you won the war, you would lose it to the nuclear winter. And it became uh, uh, quite a big topic in the mid-80s. And uh, we made a, a little show, a, a five-minute animation that presented the idea in a nutshell. And it was shown at the Kremlin and at the Pentagon and at the White House. And uh, it, it really had some influence on the nuclear debate, at least in some arms control treaties. And it was odd to me because astronomical art can, on the one hand, seem about the most escapist thing possible. And I never thought that I'd have the chance to put it to a use that had to do with actually saving the planet. So that was... Uh, that was an interesting turn, a book that we published about it. But then Carl re returned to space and uh, we did a, uh, a big book about uh, when Halley's Comet returned in 1986, again, using a team of many artists. 
some of the cosmos artists and then artists from the new generation of space artists, some of whom had been inspired by our work on cosmos. The final project I did with Carl was uh, Contact. I had done the cover for the novel uh, back in 86, but about 10 years later, a film version of it uh, was being made. And my, my role on it was to design the astronomical animation sequences, especially the opening sequence, which originally the director didn't want to have any big space sequences in the movie, but Carl argued that that's what his audience would want. So the compromise was the sequence that opens the movie. Here's some of the storyboards for it. If you haven't seen the film and want to see it, it's very easy to find. It's just the beginning of the movie, just the first three or four minutes of the movie. And in a way, it was something very similar to what we had tried to do in Cosmos, but now redoing it digitally. Uh, two of our Cosmos artists, Don Davis and uh, Rick Sternbach, also committed some, submitted some storyboards to it. And then uh, the actual sequence was made at Sony Imageworks in Culver City, uh, where I came and supervised uh, some of the animation there as well. And it's been a pretty well-regarded sequence, uh, uh, been extracted and used in planetarium shows and so forth. But one of my biggest regrets is Carl never got to see it. During the uh, production of, Cos of Contact, he uh, fell ill with a very serious disease and, and died. And he saw the storyboards and worked out the sequence with me, but never saw the finished thing. I like to think that he would have liked it as much as everybody else did, but he was a perfectionist, you, you never know. Uh, I did get a chance in a way to do one more project with him. And this was in a way a follow on to the uh, Voyager Golden Record. And this was another kind of record, uh, this time a DVD and not intended for uh, aliens, but intended for humans, intended for the uh, future humans who colonize Mars. It was the brainchild of uh, Lou Friedman, uh, shown here, who came up with the idea of sending science fiction to Mars as a way of memorializing Isaac Asimov, uh, who was dying, and a great friend of the Planetary Society, the organization that Carl had started, uh, partially as a result of the success of Cosmos and that Lou Friedman headed for many years. And on the record were, uh, primarily stories of Mars, what we what uh, a science fictional view of Mars before we got there, space art about Mars, and then some radio programs about Mars, including uh, one of my own. As I said, I was a radio journalist for CBC and was there the night of the, Mar the Mars landing, the Viking landing, and interviewed Heinlein and Bradbury and Roddenberry and Nichelle Nichols and many other people. So all of that's on there including a greeting from Carl, whose voice may be heard on Mars in centuries to come. This is a montage that gives you some idea of some of the some of the contents of it and two views of the of the spacecraft carrying it, the Phoenix spacecraft actually on Mars. Here's the disk and here you see it shortly after landing and then covered with dust. And there it there it stays. If you want to hear some of that radio program, you can go to uh, uh, search John Lomberg videos on YouTube, and you'll be able to hear Carl's greeting uh, on Mars and find out more about these uh, Mars projects. I did one other Mars uh, message project, this one with uh, Jim Bell and Bill Nye and uh, several other people, including Tyler Nordgren and, and Woody Sullivan and Steve Squires, hope I didn't forget anybody, forget anybody, designing a sundial that was placed on actually three Mars rovers. You can see it here on the back of, uh, uh, that's either Spirit or Opportunity. There's a view of it on Curiosity. There on Mars is the sundial. And what it is, it's an experiment for kids uh, to see how a sundial works on Mars. And the designers asked me to come in and, and have a hand in designing the face of the sundial. One of the suggestions I made was putting the name for Mars uh, in different languages all around the face. 
But I thought, you know, someday if there's anybody on Mars, they're going to find this sundial. And why don't we use the space around the edges to leave a message for them? So Bill and I wrote it and I illustrated it with uh, some children's drawings from kids on the mission and two of my own kids, in fact, uh, about what the sundial is, why it's there, and a little message of, uh, of hope and fellowship to the beings on Mars in the future. Humans, of course, we don't expect aliens to be able to read our computer disks, but humans of the future probably will be able to. They may have to dig around in a museum to find out how to do it, but it's kind of thrilling to me to think that uh, so much of what we thought about Mars will be echoing on Mars in centuries to come. Well, another uh, big piece I did I wanted to tell you about was a mural for the Air and Space Museum, which was the most accurate painting of our galaxy, which I've since updated a, a little bit to add a galactic star stream to it. Uh, we're not in the center of the galaxy, but we are in the center of the painting, more or less, where the diagonals cross right about there. These blue dots represent a fraction of the planets that Kepler has discovered and the uh, uh, mapping of stars and nebulae are very accurate. This is the Milky Way, as we see it from Earth, blocking out our view of the center. Uh, this is available as a poster from Astronomy Magazine, if, uh, if you're interested. Here's a close-up of the central part of it, showing some of the mapping of objects. The Kepler mission used uh, this on their website to show the uh, search space of Kepler relative to the sun and uh, our little neighborhood in the, Ori in the Orion arm. I guess I'm kind of a galaxy freak because having done the mural of the galaxy, it seemed the next logical step was to make a model of the galaxy. But it had to be big, which suggested outside, and outside suggested a garden. Another reason for, for doing it as a garden is that in a sense, the galaxy is alive and that new stars are being formed, stars are dying and in the same sort of cycle as, as plants. So I designed a galaxy garden. Here it is from the side view. You get a better view here of these trees that represent the globular clusters, uh, a number of them actually in their actual location above the galactic disk. As you enter through the Orion arm, which spurs off the Sagittarius arm, here's my daughter pointing to one random leaf. And if you look at that leaf closely, you'll see that there are actually some jewels on it. There's a little gold ball, and there are some jewels. And they represent scaled, uh, in terms of distance, uh, of most of the stars, or many of the bright stars that you can see in the sky. And one of the things that that the Galaxy Garden teaches is that you look down at the leaf and you see there's all the familiar stars. And in fact, everything we see in the sky is just the neighboring leaves. And then you look out across the whole garden and that gives a better sense of the scale of the galaxy than almost anything else that I know. In the center of the uh, galaxy, we have a, a bar and a fountain that represents the supermassive black hole at the at the galactic center and here some of its parts are labeled when you stand at the right angle you see this gravity well reflected in the fountain so you get the sense that the jet goes in both directions it's a bipolar jet we have many visitors to the garden and uh our favorite ones are of course our our kids who can learn some pretty sophisticated concepts in astrophysics. There are now two other galaxy gardens. The idea has been picked up. There's one in Delaware and there's one in Pamplona, Spain, adjacent to their planetarium. I hope you get a chance to visit some of them. And no story of my career would be complete without mentioning my work with Donald Goldsmith, one of the authors uh, of uh, Cosmos, one of the writers of Cosmos, with whom I've collaborated on many books over the years, such as his textbook about astrobiology. 
and I'm especially proud of the work we did in his book, Worlds Unnumbered, one of the first books to come out about extrasolar planets. Uh, living here in Hawaii, I, of course, had contact with the observatories and worked with many of them, especially Gemini. I illustrated many of their discoveries for a number of years, such as the uh, planetary disks we find uh, around some stars. And of course, uh, I do a lot of sky watching myself and love eclipses. This is a painting I did of the eclipse we saw here back in Hawaii. It was one of the first images to map the lights of the night sky of Earth, uh, the running from Africa across Asia to Japan, the most illuminated country in the world. And uh, all of the lights are actual objects. My favorite are the lights of the Japanese squid fishing fleet which are visible from orbit. And then the stars of Gemini and the planets are visible, are accurate for when this eclipse was. And I continue working on this with astronomers on various projects. Uh, some of the people working on galactic tidal star streams have contacted me to ask to work with them around uh, some of this great new field of galactic astronomy, the star streams that, that circle galaxies. So I still stay active uh, as, as much as I can. And this is really a great time to be an astronomical artist. I'm, I remember the first Sputnik and uh, when Mount Palomar was the best telescope in the world. So seeing how astronomy has evolved and, and being a part of it has been just uh, tremendously rewarding. I guess of all the accolades I, I've uh, received the most uh, meaningful to me has been having an asteroid named after me. Don't worry, it's a nice safe Mars crosser. It's not gonna hit the earth, but uh, asteroid Lomberg is out there. Uh, let me just remind you about the uh, book Encyclopedia Cosmologica, the history of the universe in 140 pages and pictures. And it's coming out later this year. You can find out more about it at that address. You can go to my website, johnlomberg.com, to see a lot of the pictures and art that I've shown here. Or you can go to Astronomy Magazine's My Science Shop to see the posters of mine that they sell. So with that, let me just uh, thank the organizers again for inviting me to give this talk. And uh, thank you all for your kind attention. Thank you, thank you very much, John, for accepting this invitation and giving us this talk. Uh, wonderful, wonderful, and uh, yeah, it's. I, I think everybody agrees that uh, Carl Sagan and others were only able to do this uh, because of uh, your work, complementing their work. Um, artists play so much an important uh, important role in in popularizing science and. Uh, getting all these messages across. Thank you very much. So now the floor is open for questions. Uh, please use the Q&A uh, button on your screen to send any questions you have. Uh, let me start with the panelists here. Uh, is If anybody has any questions from John? Go ahead, Chris. Uh, well, of course. First, I mean, having dabbled in the art world too, I have to say what an inspiration all the work that you did with uh, with cosmos was uh to all of us so thank you uh it was very inspiring uh, i'm kind of curious um do you still like to do physical artwork or have you abandoned the true faith and gone to digital these days i have to admit that i'm almost entirely digital these days but what i enjoy doing is going back through you know years and years of sketchbooks and uh uh doodles and and uh digitizing them and then reworking them and adding to them uh digitally yeah very cool i would just like to comment that i really enjoyed your piece when you were working with the acetate sheets i like to do a little pop art too sometimes and i use acetate sheets so I really appreciate your beautiful artwork. Thank you. 
Thank you. Okay, uh, we have a question from the audience. Uh, they wonder if there was a picture of a thermonuclear blast in the Golden Record, Voyager Golden Records. No, and that was by intention. Uh, Carl and Frank Drake, the two heads of the project, uh, both were in agreement that the purpose of this message was to, in a way, in a way, it was our obituary. It was a combination of obituary and dating site profile. And in neither venue do you tell about the worst things you've ever done. The idea is that this artifact is going to survive us. And let's be remembered for Mozart, not Hitler. And uh, there was another reason. Uh, Carl didn't want anything that could be misconstrued as a threat even though we are hardly a non-threatening species, he didn't want any part of the message to seem aggressive. And uh, that was one of his stated reasons for specifically telling us not to include a, uh, a thermonuclear blast or any explicit uh, references to war, poverty, injustice, cruelty. Never mind the fact that it would be very difficult to show those things to an alien and have their meaning understood. I mean, a starving baby is tremendously uh, emotionally and powerful to us, but to an alien, maybe that's how a baby is supposed to look. So I'm glad I do it in charge with trying to convey those ideas as well. Let's see, thank you. Um, there is another question. Uh, might you describe online someday how you constructed Carl's personal galaxy model? Maybe I will someday. <laughs> I've done, I, there was a period I was doing those models uh, for a number of museums. I did one for a museum uh, in Toronto, the Ontario Science Centre, and then I did another one for the uh, Sonora Desert Museum in Tucson. Uh, but like everything else, uh, exhibit technology was completely upended by the digital revolution and people just don't make exhibits that way anymore. Okay. And, uh, you, you mentioned that you've gone fully digital. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the tools that you use? Are, are you using an iPad and an Apple Pencil, or are you using some more sophisticated uh, stuff to do your digital work? Well, it depends on the, it depends on the project. Uh, ever since Cosmos, uh, I work with computer graphics, uh, not generating them myself, but usually working as a designer or art director with uh, uh, companies or projects that are that are doing it. So I've been designing things which has kept me working with uh, whether it's uh, back in the day alias, you know, up through things like flame and uh, those kind of high end uh, uh, digital tools. In my own studio, I pretty much restricted to Photoshop and Illustrator and uh, those Adobe kinds of tools. And as I say, I do a lot of uh, scanning of uh, old style art and uh, retouching it or using it as an element in, in, in something digital. And I use a stylus, a graphic stylus, but uh, I don't think that I'm in any way a, a, a cutting edge person in terms of computer graphics. I What I try to do with digital stuff is make them look like my paintings looked. Let's see. Great. Now here we have an interesting question. So uh, one of the audience uh, says that he has an original issue of Murmurs of Earth, uh, which is autographed by all authors, uh, including you. Uh, the final autograph he has obtained was from Tim Ferriss, who has told him that that might be the only copy with all author signatures. And uh, this would make it truly unique since he could not remember any signing events, either public or private. So now the question is, do you know if there are any other fully autographed copies? Not to my knowledge. And uh, by the way, that it's worth mentioning that the person asking the question is Tim Hoggle, our member who uh, was a chief uh, 
person in Voyager team, and he got all the signatures while he was working uh, on the Voyager spacecraft. Well, that's a, that's a rare piece of memorabilia right there. Perfect. Um, so I think uh, right now is actually the perfect time to announce that uh, for those of you who are interested in uh, getting more of John's work, uh, he has made a special offer for OCA members and people who are attending this meeting um, that uh, you could get a significant discount on getting some of his uh, artwork. Um, John, would you mind telling us about this offer? Yeah, if you go to my website and look for uh, the limited edition prints that you see there, I'll make those available uh, to you for $60 each uh, plus shipping. So if you want to order, you can just contact me. Uh, I guess you can contact me through the society, through uh, Orange County Astronomers, or I'm easy to find on the internet. And uh, let me know, and you can have one. Yes, sure. So uh, the instructions for, for getting this offer is included in the on our website on the page of uh, this meeting at the very bottom, bottom of it. So uh, I encourage everybody who's interested to go and check it out. Um, so uh, this was all the questions so far. Let me uh, put another call for uh, if anybody has any questions, maybe from the people in person, uh, I guess they were not able to fully hear us, but anybody there has any questions? Uh, Raisa, okay. I think there may be some on the chat. Okay, let me check. So I on the chat, I see a couple of people saying their kudos and highs to you, but no questions. Uh, oh. And Ray, so we have uh, somebody who's coming down uh, to use the oh, microphone. Sure. sure. Hello. Hi. Uh, could you share with us what technique you use to kind of make sure when you draw uh, everything is accurate to where they should be? Do you put down the stars first and then draw around it? Or is it, do you have like reference and like, how do you go about doing that? Well, it, it, it depends. It, uh, very often I'm working with uh, an astronomer and often they will provide reference material and sometimes the reference material will be the act as kind of a template for what I, for what I do. Uh, often there's, uh, or always, there's a lot of iteration where <clears throat> the astronomer will say, make that bigger, brighter, bluer, uh, and we'll go back and forth until I get it. And it's hard because uh, one of the interesting things is how things look is a more subtle question. Uh, and it often depends on what it is you're trying to show. Uh, is it supposed to be what you would see if you were really there? But uh, there, you know, most astronomical photography isn't that. You can't see what most astrophotography shows. So do you, do you have the same flexibility that uh, astrophotographers take or that Hubble uses in colorizing? So um, there's no one truth. There's you know a million ways to do something like the Orion Nebula, say, uh, depending on whether it's for a, a astronomy exhibit or a kid's nursery. Oh, sorry, sorry to hog the mic. Uh, I do have a follow-up question given that. Sure. Um, so it does sound like it's a push-pull between what folks want to show and what they're trying to kind of, I guess, show out like based on the data. Uh, in that iteration, iterative process you were talking about, how often do you find yourself, uh, aside from making the art, of course, contributing to what you think is important to kind of display? Well, it, it, again, it depends. If <clears throat> if you're doing something for uh, for a publication with a with a scientific release, like for the Gemini Observatory, then the scientist is really in the driver's seat, and you work it till till they're happy with it. 
and they're if, if it goes through a public information office you know they may want to put text on it and they may want to make different versions of it um but sometimes i'll i'll uh want to make the colors a little more distinct or, or 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 use the colors to differentiate things in uh structure that i think are important to show i mean traditionally the the role of illustration in in science and and why the camera didn't make it obsolete is that uh the camera to the camera all details are equal but to the artist you can suppress irrelevant details uh you can emphasize important details uh in the same way that a, a medical illustrator uh showing uh, showing human anatomy can make the blood vessels that the student is interested in in uh, learning about more prominent in the illustration than they might be to the eye because you're trying to teach them where they are so uh depending on how didactic the piece is versus how just eye candy it is uh whether it's a new discovery or something very fanciful out of my own imagination uh it really depends on the piece how much artistic license I can take sometimes a lot sometimes sometimes very little um we have another person here uh first of all I'd like to tell you how much I've enjoyed your work over the years um is there any um can you give us any insight as to uh whether or not you had a relationship or or were influenced by Chesley Bonstall? I really wasn't. I mean, I had seen his work, but as maybe is clear from, from a lot of my work, I'm more interested in showing ideas, I mean, sort of apart from galaxies, which I'm just in love with galaxies, but I wasn't ever as much interested as what would it look like on Mars if you were standing there, as much as why are we going to Mars? So I didn't view my role as being a sort of a, a pseudo camera. Sometimes there, there, was, there was a great push. I sort of had to do that. And in a lot of cases, that's what the market wanted and that's what, that's what people wanted. So I had to learn to do that, but it was never really where my heart was. My heart was doing the kind of more idea and conceptual uh, oriented pieces. Uh, but of course, I learned about Chesley, and as I started meeting other artists, I saw how influential how influential he was to them, and it would be false to deny that uh, I didn't I don't admire his work. But especially when I was starting out and getting the sense of what it was I wanted to do, uh, I was more interested in influenced by people like Salvador Dali and Jim Steranko and uh, some of the uh, psychedelic artists of the time. Thank you very much. It's a thrill to talk to you. It looks like there may be another, a few more Q and A's. I, I do have some more questions from the audience. So um, somebody says the discussion about whether to include a new uh, thermonuclear explosion image on the Voyager record was very interesting. Uh, can you describe generally the discussions you and the team had to define and describe the objectives and philosophy of the images and messages included on the record? It would have been nice if we had any time to do that, but we didn't. The, uh, the crazy thing about the project was you're making something to last for a billion years and you have six weeks to do it and no budget and very little staff. So it is not best view it as a NASA project. NASA projects have many layers of review. They're carefully planned. There's a lot of oversight. There was none of that. This was more like a bunch of people getting together and doing an art project in a very short amount of time. So there was a lot of trust that we had in each other. Uh, Carl and Frank were you know, luminaries in the field and they had really set the tone of what SETI and extraterrestrial messaging should be like with the uh, pioneer plaque and the Arecibo message and, and, their, and their writings. So they, they more or less set the tone. And then it was a lot, for me anyway, a lot of, of individual decisions. Uh, as far as the pictures went, 
Uh, we polled a bunch of people, what things should we include? And I think the list was probably similar to what most people would, would say, you know, animals, landscapes, cities, so forth. There were some individual uh, suggestions, uh, especially from Philip Morrison from MIT, who suggested uh, the page from the book uh, uh, in fact, spe which specific page from which book, a book by Isaac Newton, showing for the first time how to launch something into orbit with a diagram that might actually be understandable. Uh, so there were a number of uh, other people who contributed specific ideas to it, but uh, it, was, it was cobbled together from the inside out, not theoretically organized from the top down. Interesting, interesting. Thank you. Uh, next, we have a question about Encyclopedia Galactica. Uh, so the questioner wants to know if it's the actual precursor to that wholly remarkable book, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, which is well known as the standard repository of all wisdom and knowledge. The term Encyclopedia Galactica had been floating around ever since Isaac Asimov used it in the Foundation trilogy. And no doubt Douglas Adams, the author of Hitchhiker's Guide, was familiar with it. Uh, Carl sort of picked up the term and, and started uh, running with it. And then he and I put our own interpretation on it. But I don't think that Douglas Adams, uh, when did I first hear Hitchhiker's Guide? Around 1980, I guess. And uh, if there was any cross-pollination from, from the Sagan orbit, I don't know about it. I tend to think not. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is, uh, did Giuseppe Cocconi, Philip Morrison, Morrison, or Enrico Fermi ever collaborated with Sagan? Philip Morrison, definitely. Philip Morrison collaborated with Carl on a book called Mars and the Mind of Man, which was in a way a precursor to our uh, Visions of Mars DVD on Mars, and it, it had people from different uh, backgrounds, different disciplines talking about the uh, importance of Mars in, in human culture and history. And uh, Morrison was one of the founding fathers of SETI and definitely influenced Carl a lot. I had uh, a lunch with them together a few times uh, at Carl's home in, in Ithaca, and it was amazing hearing the two of them talk, just two of the smartest men I ever knew, just banding ideas back and forth. It was, uh, it was a joy to watch. Thank you. And uh, next question is, who are some of the people you talk to now that Carl is gone about the possibility of contact with extraterrestrial life? You know, there's kind of a subculture of people, uh, independent researchers and some scientists who are, are interested in SETI. But I have to say, uh, it seems to me that there has been a decrease of interest in SETI. Uh, and I think there are two reasons for it. One is the failure to find anything, despite a lot of projects. Now you can say the universe is very big and we've hardly explored a lot, but at the same time, there've been a lot of searches for a lot of years, well-funded, and we've just come up empty. And I think that's been a kind of a discouraging uh, uh, thing that's in the community. It would be wrong to deny it. I remember when I went to Frank Drake's uh, 50th celebration of Ozma in 2010, one of the things that people were commenting on was how few young scientists were getting into SETI because it seemed like a, a career ender. Why spend your career on something where you may have no publishable results except your instrumentation? So the truth is there aren't a lot of people around who are still interested in talking about it. There are some. Uh, some of the most productive conversations I've had recently have been with uh, Ethan Siegel, the author of, uh, of the Encyclopedia Cosmologica, who takes a more pessimistic view of life in the universe than Carl did. And we've had some very interesting conversations about the Drake equation and updating it and uh, the likelihood of life, uh, which in some senses seems even more likely. So many of the discoveries we've made are all in support of lots of planets, 
lots of habitable planets, lots of biochemistry, lots of amino acids and meteorites, you know, everything seems suggestive of it, but that magic missing link, there's still a lot of people who are, who are very uh, skeptical about it. Thank you. And uh, the next question is from the owner of that uh, unique piece, uh, who, who, as I mentioned, was the one of the chief engineers on the Voyager spacecraft. On a talk he recently gave, he was asked a question that was not able to answer about the record. So what is the speed at which the Voyager record was to be played to get the accurate musical rendition? 16 and two thirds, which is half the speed of an LP, 33 and a third. And that was one of the great contributions that Frank made. Frank was the Thomas Edison of the project. He was the one who figured out how to do it, how to do everything about doing it. And he, <clears throat> one of the challenges in doing the pictures, for example, was when they first asked me to come on board, they thought they could send 10 pictures. And then what happened was Frank kept figuring out ways to fit more pictures on. And one of the ways was to, reduce the playing time to half speed. For a slight a loss of fidelity in the music, you gained, uh, you've virtually doubled the contents of the record. So that was a trade-off that they decided was worth making. So the answer is 16 and two thirds. We can't hear you, Reza. Sorry. Uh, thank you. And we have another question. Do you have anything to say about the future of astronomy from land-based telescopes? And the questioner is uh, from Hawaii. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the future for land-based telescopes is bright. We're developing these, uh, these giant mirrors and actually getting some of them to work uh, in, in Chile. Uh, I don't think there will be one in on Mauna Kea. I don't think the TMT has a chance of being built here at this time. And uh, but I think that's I, I hope that it gets built, and I hope that's just a temporary setback, and they find uh, a suitable location. The Canary Island one seems uh, seems pretty good. Uh, but I think that ground-based telescopes have kind of kept pace with their space-based counterparts. I mean not taking anything away from Hubble or the glories of Webb, uh, it's just amazing to me what ground-based observing is capable of doing now. And uh, there's always going to be a role for it, just as there's always going to be a role for the smaller observatories that, that study a lot of the objects that are still profitably studied by telescopes, which can't match the big boys, but still have a lot of great science to do. So uh, I think the future of astronomy looks bright. Perfect, thank you very much. And uh, what a great uh, answer to end the meeting with. Uh, the future looks bright. Um, and uh, I would like to thank everybody in attendance uh, for joining us and uh, hearing uh, John. Uh, I wish you all great times ahead. Please check the uh, calendar on our website, ocastronomers.org, for all the events and information to join. I again want to thank John very much for joining us and doing this talk. Uh, before ending Pleasure. the meeting, John, do you have any final remarks? No, just it was a joy to do and uh, best wishes to everybody. Thank you very much and bye-bye everybody.